So a little bit ago, I was asked this question of how, what can you do to be a good teacher? I have been tutoring for years, more than a decade probably. And of course I was asked, hey, what, what can I do? I want to be a teacher. How can I be a good one? And it's a great question because, um, you know, teaching people is a good thing. And I think, I think the ability to teach is actually more fundamental than people realize it is. Um, Aristotle used, it, used the ability to teach something as a sort of litmus test for if you actually know what you're talking about. And it sort of makes sense because when you understand something, you're able to construct analogies out of it. Right. And, and so you, if you know what you're talking about, you can construct these analogies to explain it, right? Explain likeness of it. And if you have to teach someone it, oftentimes you can't just tell them what you were told because we're all different. We all have these different backgrounds and different understandings of things. And if you know what you're talking about, you're going to be able to construct new analogies to teach someone. And so, you know, it's very, it's sort of important to be able to teach something. It's really a, a strong indicator that you do know what you're talking about. And I think even just sort of intuitively, being able to teach something shows you have a familiarity with it. You have a, you have a, a, a grasp of it. You have a use of it that is more than just a sort of rote memorization, but that you're comfortable talking about it. You're comfortable knowing about it, explaining it, aside from the analogies and stuff like that. And that's a much deeper t topic. We'll have to do something where we talk strictly about, strictly about analogies and how all human knowledge comes out of analogies and, and why this is important to understand. But for the meantime, you know, I was just asked this question, how do I teach well? And the person asking this, I think what they're asking is, how do I teach well in the context of like a teacher at a school, like a public school? Which is, uh, in some ways, it's, you know, it's, it shares the universality of teaching that tutoring does, right? Because the tutoring goes happens one-on-one. -on -one. Or small groups, are very, you know, rarely. You know, informally, rarely, that kind of thing. But... In some other ways, it's a completely different it's a completely different situation because you have completely different limitations, and to be quite frank, completely different priorities. And this is where sort of the ugliness of the system comes from, and it needs to be talked about. So, I was writing my notes out on how I wanted to explain this, and I realized there was sort of so much to talk about that. I'm going to break this up into two parts. The first part is I'm going to talk about where I think we are with public school. And not just public school, because even private schools try to do the same thing that public schools do, this sort of mass learning environment where you have a teacher who does these kind of semi-lectures <laughs> to classes of, you know, a dozen, you know, two dozen kids. So... We're going to talk about that because this is kind of a big deal because it's going to frame the obstacles of what a teacher has to overcome to actually try to meaningfully teach someone something. And that's going to be part one. And then part two is going to be what I found is the most important stuff when it comes to teaching somebody something. Aside from the obvious, no, actually, actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> Right, that's a necessary prerequisite. You have to know what you're talking about to teach it to someone, which is funny because I don't think many people believe this. I think a lot of our, I think a lot of people are under the impression that you can teach things you barely understand, and that probably explains why so many people who go through our public school system barely understand anything either. Because if the teacher barely understands, why are they gonna? Why are they gonna understand it? So. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about this sort of modern Western school system. This where you have this huge, uh, this hu you know, you have someone, you have this like lecturer who, I call them semi lectures because, um, you know, if you've been through public school, like 
lecturing is only part of it. There's usually a lot more shenanigans going on. Things like we have to do these activities or let's talk about the homework or let's talk about these other random things and stuff like that. So when we talk about these teachers, what are these teachers trying to accomplish, right? Why, you know, I want to be, I want to, I see that there's this thing called teaching or like these public school teachers. There are these teachers, right? What's the difference between a liar, a liar player and a, a good liar player, right? The liar player plays it, plays the liar, but the li good liar player plays it well. So we look at these teachers, there's these teachers. I want to be a teacher. The question I'm asking is how do I become a good teacher? It's a good question. And necessarily, what's the, what's the first necessary thing we have to ask? Well, if we want to be a good one, we have to ask, what are they doing in the first place? Or more accurately, what are they trying to do? Because that's going to be revealing. Because the naive assumption is that, well, what they're trying to do is that they're going to have knowledge and they want all the kids that they're teaching to have the same knowledge. That's the naive assumption. And in a just world, that actually would make sense. And to be honest, this is going to be the question I'm going to try answering because the person who asked me this is a just person who is going to want to be a teacher for that sake. But there's going to be a lot of obstacles that get in your way for this. And this is because you have to learn about the origin of the public school system and why it's here, why it persists, and what they're trying to do. Because it turns out you actually learning something is not the priority, funny enough. And that's a, that, this is something that, um, for some reason, most people know this. Like if you ask, if you tell people this, like if you ask someone, hey, what do you remember about public school? Like, did the teachers really seem like they even wanted to be there? I don't think I've ever met someone who would say, oh yeah, totally. They were really motivated people. Like <laughs> nobody would say that. And I can even say that right now kind of sounds funny, right? But, you know, but then, so if everybody knows this, then why is it so controversial when you bring up, that's because the system doesn't, isn't about teaching you. It's actually about all these other things. People suddenly get really hesitant. And I think this is, <laughs> funny enough, this is also a product of the public school system. And let's get into that. What is the public school system all about? And I'm speaking about strictly the United States, but I suspect that this holds true for many more places. What was the first and primary reason for creating public schools? It's actually really well documented and really well understood. It was about enculturalization. It was specifically created to enculturize incoming Catholic immigrants. It was a Protestant initiative. And this is sort of important because the sort of big lie that people always bring up is that, oh, well, the, uh, you know, public school, it's about the uh, elimination of, um, you know, it's about the elimination of, um, uh, um, wow, literacy, you know, illiteracy. And it's about um, preparing everyone and making better citizens so they can vote better. This is all after the fact rationalization mythology quite literally mythology, just these myths about how great it is. It, it, the primary purpose of public school was specifically an anti-Catholic measure um, to sort of try and eliminate these Catholic cultures that were immigrating, you know, in, in great numbers. And all this left, you know, progressive leftist, mo whatever you want to call it, this, this liberal sort of mythology about uh, where they come from and what they're for. Uh, it's all just it's all just made up. So it's just mythology, and this 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 was the first and primary reason for their creation. And you might notice this is still true. This is still the primary purpose of public schools is enculturalization. Granted, it's no longer strictly anti-Catholic enculturalization. It's actually um, you know much more topical, right? It's often. Uh, whatever the most progressive modern agenda is, that's what the whole point of public school is, is to make sure you have an understanding of what ideas are tolerable and what ideas are not tolerable. And it's, <laughs> it's 
very it's it's very well timed that we are now in the middle of this uh, pandemic, where um, homeschooling is is becoming extremely popular because it turns out having a bunch of kids sitting at a computer being yelled at by a public school teacher is just a huge waste of time and parents don't like it. So everyone's turning to home, homeschooling. And, and so you have a, a plethora, of, a plethora of, of articles of people who are very anti-homeschooling um, and, want, and think it's better for kids to go to public school. And you, so, so right now, this isn't like, because sometimes you say these things and, and people will go, oh, well, the way, the way you phrase it, it's, it's very, it's, it implies it's overly sinister, right? Like you, you make it sound like it's a conspiracy, right? If you can, if you can call something a conspiracy, uh, like, you know, 40% of the people you talk to are just going to write it off as meaningless now, right? You know, it's, you make it sound more sinister than it is. It's like, no, it's, I'm saying exactly what it is because, and, and this is my favorite part. Um, you can go right now and just Google, you know, any article you want about these people who are against homeschooling. Um, probably even Google that. Uh, you know, go go to Google, enter um, homeschooling, bad, uh, you know, pandemic, and, and then see what comes up, right? Probably something by Slate or CNN or uh, NBC or, you know, one of those organizations. And you can read these articles and they'll, and they'll straight say, why is this bad? Why is homeschooling bad? And they will straight say, well, because then they won't know what the right ideas are. Like they'll just be at home being told all these wrong ideas by their parents about politics. Like they won't believe in diversity, whatever that's supposed to mean. They won't believe in this anymore. Like it, the, the point of public school still first is primarily about enculturalization. It's about making sure you understand what ideas are acceptable and what ideas are not acceptable. And this is why being a bad teacher, not being able to teach kids anything is not a condemning factor. Like you won't lose your job over that. You won't lose your job over being extremely bad, incapable of having uh, of propagating information to, to students. You will lose your job over if you try to spread unacceptable ideas. That will not fly. You will be shut down. You will be shuffled around, and you will be you will be punished. And that's because the primary point of public school is enculturalization. It was in the beginning, and it still is. And anyone who says otherwise, they're just. I mean, you don't want to call people names. You don't want to psychologize people. Um, but they just don't know what they're talking about. And they either from experience or from. I mean, you can even just go read, like, I, I hate Wikipedia. I think it's just so destructive. But, like, if you can go read Wikipedia and be caught up on this, then you really have no excuse. Um, it's because people buy into the sort of civil mythology of public schools. I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but people refer to public school teachers like they're saints, like they're living saints, which is baffling since, dem, dem, you know, demographically there are... A, uh, a questionable bunch. Um, I'll just say, look up public school molestation rates. Um, we'll just leave it at that. So, anyway, you know, it, it's very funny that it's just very weird that we're, you know, it's very funny that we're in this position where it's, you know, you're just not allowed to question this. And and I think that's a part of it. I think people not recognizing, not being allowed to talk about public schools as in culturalization institutions you know, that's part of it. You're not, that's not an acceptable idea you're allowed to have, right? No, public schools are about uh, making sure that everyone's on the same page and that you're an informed voter who makes good decisions, which really just means vote Democrat. Let's not lie. That's what, when people say that, that's what they mean, that you vote Democrat. And, <laughs> and you have the right ideas and, you, and you're not allowed, and you, don't, and you know what the wrong ideas are. And you know, and you and you understand that some ideas just you need to accept. And if in, uh, you know, if you don't agree, you better just shut up. Um, or that's actually not even true anymore. If you don't agree now, you you have to agree. Silence is no longer allowed. You know, you're not allowed to sit it out. You got to. But that's another thing. So anyway, public schools are primarily about enculturalization. So right off the bat, if you want to be a good teacher, you're already at 
a problem if your belief is that being a teacher is about um, teaching kids things. <laughs> no, being a teacher is your first and primary responsibility is going to be to enculturalize the students into the acceptable and good normal ideas that you're told are the good ideas, right? So if your goal is to be a good person who educates people, you're going to be working against the system right off the bat. So that's number one. Secondly, public schools are a sort of government subsidized daycare center. And this is why I like to compare high schools to prisons because there is this great line I heard or read, right? Whatever you want to call it. That where someone said high schools are very much prisons for young people because like prisons, high school is the only time that most people will have a realistic chance of experiencing physical violence. You like you go rest of your life, you'll never have a realistic chance of experiencing physical violence. You'll go to work and your workplaces and you stay in nice places of town and you know, you'll just there's a really good chance you'll never be under the threat of, of violence. High school is the only place where that's not true. <laughs> it's very much like prison. And I mean they're often run like prisons. Um, this is actually this is this is this is sort of a tangent, but um, this is double funny for me because the company that serviced my high school also serviced, to my understanding, the county jail. So my high school even had the food of the prisons, <laughs> which is uh, makes this this thing I would later understand much funnier, at least to me. And so you have to understand that these these institutions now also serve as an economic um, sort of repository where uh, children are left um, specifically so that parents can maintain careers. And this is important because, like, as I said, kind of, it's funny that we're at this time of this pandemic where everything's shut down. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but one of the biggest things, biggest problems for most people is that it turns out parents don't know what to do with their kids. A lot of parents are completely baffled about what do they do with their kids because a major part of sending them off to public school was that they were being monitored for several hours, you know, eight hours a day, and the and the parent can go off to work and get to work get work done or or nothing, right? And now that the parent actually has to parent their children, they're at a complete loss because that was their understanding. They can maintain their career, they can maintain their economic output. Um, and even with kids, because essentially you just ship these kids off to daytime prison and um, and you're good. And so this is, I think this is a major thing because this is something I've seen people even bring up about women in careers where women can get back into their careers once kids start going to public school, right? Or private schools that are based like public schools, right? That are based on, you know, the same sort of design as a public school. And so it's kind of funny that that's this is sort of a big thing like this that this this public school the public school system has um, sort of become entwined with this idea of everyone working constantly, right? And so that's just something to keep in mind. So that's the second thing, and this is important because as a teacher you have to understand if this is the secondary reason that people you know, utilize this system the way they do, then that means you're not even really expected to do anything for these kids. Your goal is to manage the kids, not teach the kids. So if you, if you, so, so your first duty, which is why it comes from the top down is to enculturalize them, right? Some people say indoctrinate, but then the moment you do that, you get all the weird knee jerk, like, oh, it's a conspiracy. And, you know, you're just saying things and you're making it sound bad. It's like, okay, well, I'll say enculturalize because that's their word, right? That's the word they want to use. you right. So we'll use that. Your first duty that comes down from above is that you have to enculturalize these kids. And the second duty, this comes from the bottom up because this comes from the parents, is you have to manage these kids. So actually teaching them things like science and history and writing and stuff 
if, if this is still a, a, a goal, it's at, it's at least the third priority now underneath these other two. But I don't even think it's the third priority because let's keep going, right? So we now have this problem where the pretense of these institutions is that kids go to them and they come out with more knowledge or skills or experiences that are useful. That's the pretense, right? But it turns out that's not even really true either because there is a sort of identity crisis even for this sort of false pretense of what these institutions are about, right? They say that these institutions, you know, the, you know, so let's just say someone really buys into the myth that, that's, you know, oh, it's about, it's about, it's about learning. It's public learning and it's good and it makes the citizenry better and it's more economic output. That's like a big one you'll see if you ever read about arguments for it is that it, it helps economic output, right? So, so let's just say you buy into that. Well, there's still a problem because, um, nobody's actually sure what they even want the kids to be taught because there is two competing ideas one which is the liberal arts tradition which is the idea that you want kids to learn these good and varied things so that they become cultivated into better people right which it's kind of funny even me saying that right now that just sounds so quaint compared to like the things people say now on the internet or even in real life. Like like that idea of this enlightenment idea of if we just sort of, which I mean, it's really just a Hellenistic idea, right? It comes from ancient Greece, right? If you educate these people in the ways of leisure, right? And I, I don't mean leisure as in doing nothing. It's the things you can study when you have leisure with like mathematics and science and history and astronomy and you know all that stuff. If you educate someone in this, it's gonna better prepare them for sort of uh, being able to inculcate the everything about their life like inculcate virtues and better social you know interactions and develop themselves as humans like you know they can have relationships and they can do something with their with themselves and so this is that that's the idea this liberal arts tradition so it's like that's like one part of the myth right like oh we want why do we want to teach kids all this stuff because we it's it, it just going to help them be better humans right it'll give them more analogies nobody nobody in the 21st century except me has said that but <laughs> and I, I i sometimes actually believe that i'm like because sometimes i'll be like i can't really be the only person who talks about this stuff but um who talks about you know this sort of ancient greek you know aristotelian concepts concept of education so i'm like but it sometimes feels that way, um, you know. But but basically, that's the idea. You have all you get more analogies, so you can learn more and new, do more, and you just become and you become more enlightened. So, so that's like that's like one half of it, right? That you know, if you if you believe in this myth of what the public school is for, you have like that that arm that arm saying, we teach kids all this stuff so it makes them better people. This is a problem, though, because we don't live in a culture that cares about that kind of thing. We live in a, um, I hate the term people say, oh, materialistic culture. I hate that because it, because what ends up happening is they go, oh, it's like a consumer culture as if humans have not been producing things to be consumed since the dawn of time or that consuming things is necessarily bad. I, I it's just, it's so, it's just such a sort of meme complaint, um, but it's like, I, I think the best way to describe it is, I, I like to call it a, a mechanistic culture. We live in a culture where we really value um, this sort of mechanistic understanding of things. If I do this, I get this. If I do this, I can do this now. If I do this, this can happen. Is What can this thing do? It does this. Like, it's like, and so, so we have this situation where... Uh, this and this was a big complaint. Um, uh, I don't even know, like two thousand around two thousand, right? This was like a big thing. Yeah, about the year two thousand is when I remember it became like a big hot thing. People were saying, complaining, saying, um, you know, our kids are going through public school and they're not qualified for the job market. <laughs> that was the big thing. You go to high school and you can't, and you're not qualified for the job market. You can't be hired with any skills. And so 
um, there became this big goal, this big shift of, um, well, what's the public school's purpose? And a lot of people said, well, it's obvious to me, the, the goal of public school should be to teach you how to get a job. It should teach you things that make it make you worth hiring. And um, this had some good and bad out, out, uh, outcomes. One of them was a, a, a rededication to um, what we call like STEM fields, mathematics and the sciences and stuff like that. It's like, and, and because the idea was that this is what's most profitable, right? This is what's most employable. Um, and I don't think that's untrue, to be honest. Um, you've heard me talk at great lengths where I'm like, I tell people, if you can cut it, just be a physics major. You can, you can get any job you want. Like I personally, um, like I, I know another person with a physics degree, what do they do? They just went into finance, like instantly, no problem, right? This became a senior financial analyst after like five years of working in finance. Like it's just, it's so easy with a physics degree. Um, like I personally, uh, like I just instantly started taking jobs that you would expect like an engineer to take, right? But it's just, well, I got a physics degree. I can just do a job of an engineer, right? It just takes me like five seconds to catch up on whatever you need. So it's just like, so it's just like, I just tell people, if you can cut it, just get a physics degree. The, things, the thing is the key to everything. You, just, you get that, you can do whatever you want with your life. Um, and so it's just like, and I mean, we won't talk too much about it here, but I think it's because of its um, unique position at the top of sort of intellectual hierarchy, right? I would say metaphysics is above it, but we don't, nobody studies metaphysics anymore. So physics is now the winner. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, you, so, so you have this situation where it's just like, okay, well, you know, if the, the point of public school is to make you employable, so we need to push STEM because that is way more employable. And it's true, it is. Um, if you're like an engineer of really any kind, you're going to be so much more employable than uh, history or English degrees or uh, like poli-sci degrees or uh, uh, philosophy degrees, which are just so worthless. <laughs> Uh, or education degrees. Uh, I mean, it's funny. I've actually had to explain this, and, and because I'm even answering this question for someone who wants to be a teacher, um, and they're very smart, right? So it's just like, so this won't be a problem for them. But for some reason, the worst parts of a uh, student body get education degrees. I don't know why. Someone who's in there can probably ask someone why this is the case. But it, it just, I don't know why. It's just how it is. Um, so if you're if you're if you're like a really competent person and you're getting an education degree, you're probably going to be baffled by everybody around you. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, so so you had this sort of these these sort of competing ideas. What is the whole point of public school, right? And so now you have these two competing arguments that like, well, it's about making you employable, right? A very mechanistic understanding of what education is for. And then you had the other, the other more traditional side, right? That's like, no, it's, it's about, uh, you know, it's about the liberal arts. It's about cultivating yourself as a person and, and being enlightened and stuff like that. Um, and, and I don't think, I think even within the mythology, I don't think we've really settled this. I still think we haven't in the year 2020. I don't think we've settled this um, because it's, it's sort of becoming more clear the recent administration and sort of the public reaction to it, it's becoming increasingly clear that the mythology is just a bunch of BS and, and people are now really realizing that you can take them at their word and that public school is about enculturalization and it is about daycare for better economic growth, better economic productivity of the parents. And um, what the kids learn is, is a very distant concern. Down, It's a very low priority distant concern, right? And so, People are realizing that, and that's why everybody's switching to homeschooling now. Because it turns out, you know, the mythology is really either of those mythologies are better than in culturalization and daycare, right? You have kids, you love your kids, you want them to be learn things and be better people. So if if you if you believe the liberal arts tradition, it's better to homeschool them so you can expose them to the great works of. Uh, you know, mathematics and Western literature and philosophy and history and, and all these things. Um, and if you believe in a more mechanistic philosophy, it's better to have them homeschooled so that you don't waste all their time learning stuff that's 
not really useful or employable, right? You can just have them, and then you can have them be super competent and, and very employable that way. So, so basically, like I said, I, I think I think we're kind of in the midst of a, a sort of change now, where a societal change, quote unquote, um, where people are realizing that these these sort of fake beliefs are just they're just nonsense to uh, convince people to keep public schools around. Um, but anyway. I even mentioned these are still mythologies because the public school doesn't even, as a third priority, want you to learn something authentically. So, um, you know, you sort of have the, this sort of rung of sort of priorities, right, of education where it's like, do you want to teach someone something authentically where they have a grasp of its first principles and how to use these first principles, right? like an authentic knowledge and the answer is no like that's clearly not what the public school system is designed to do even in the best light that's never was its intention because the sort of mass education does not lend itself to teaching people that sort of in-depth first principle study it just doesn't so okay let's move down the ladder okay so let's say we, we can't teach them authentic knowledge can we at least teach them useful knowledge Right, like meaningful skills, like the uh, like the mechanistic people want, and it turns out even that is kind of a long shot because um, to develop real useful working knowledge, you need uh, dedication, you need attention um, from both the instructor and the learner, and you need repetition. You need the thing that the public school system never has enough of, which is time. You need time. All right. And so what happens is that um, you sort of have a push-pull problem where you, if this, the, the, the instructor needs to be available, which they're not, right? And then the student needs to be dedicated, which they aren't. Unless you have a parent who's super, you know, who's very into discipline and, and makes their kid dedicated, right? And then, and then hires private tutors. But now at this point, you've actually eliminated the whole purpose because... Uh, okay, if this if the point of the public school is to teach someone something meaningfully, well, it turns out people of means are just going to bypass it because it's totally worthless. They're going to go hire private tutors. They're going to make their kids become dedicated at it, and they're going to handle it outside of the system because the system doesn't do that. So, so now we're down to the lowest sort of level of understanding. So you're not teaching kids authentic knowledge, right, with first principles and, and reason reason from them. You're not teaching them meaningful skills be, you know, or meaningful knowledge, useful knowledge because that takes time and habituation. So it's like, what, what are they doing then? Well, it turns out you are um, trying to – the best you can do is teach kids how to um, sort of manipulate words and do things – do simple things in a sort of reactionary sense, right? And so um, that's where we're sort of at, where it turns out the best you can sort of hope for from these sort of mass um, education environments where you just have a bunch of people being lectured at is that the best you can sort of hope for is to expose them to words and images and then just sort of uh, hope that they can manipulate these enough that someday it might develop into something more more useful or more authentic. And so what, what ends up happening is that you, you sort of start realizing that um, the, the only real meaningful way to – or sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. The only real thing that's happening in these school environments is that you are – uh, teaching people how to um, sort of absorb these tiny sort of context invariant pieces of information and how to attach them to terms and words and then how to manipulate them in a sort of pattern, right? This word always follows that word. This word's associated with that word. And, and these are sort of associated with uh, these ideas or this, this person or, or this place or whatever. And, and and then you manipulate this back to the instructor, and then if it you know if it sort of all checks out, you're you're considered as having learned something, right? And 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 I think this is why you start having this sort of situation where um, people 
try to treat everything now as these context invariant pieces of information where the idea is that you have it and now you can just understand it without understanding anything that came before it or came after it or even who's saying it or why they're saying it. It's just it, it just has definitive information that doesn't change with the context. And I mean, if you really want to get down to it, what is that? Well, we actually talk about this all the time. Those are called headlines. The whole point of a headline is that it's context invariant. Just by reading the headline, you get the sense that you know what it's talking about. And that should actually be sort of dystopian to think about that really the whole point of public school is to teach you how to convert things into headlines. And I mean, this is why it's like, there's just this sort of, um, you know, you just, people want to do this with everything. So all writing turns into this, right? People um, try to write in this very modern way where every sentence, every paragraph can be understood by itself, right? That it doesn't need to be understood in light of something that was written before it, uh, especially the preceding paragraph. Or, I mean, you'll never see this. You need to read that paragraph in light of what everything else this guy has written. Like that just would never happen, right? <clears throat> and I mean, this is, this is very much even sort of modern philosophy. Um, you see this shift uh, around like the Middle Ages where you get from people who write these large works that are dialectical in nature to um, these works that have a uh, very heavy emphasis on like uh, like propositions that you can read and, and comprehend standalone um, and then arguments that are very detailed and very specific about the propositions that they're defending. And you see this all the way up to the modern times, like even contemporary um, times, you still have this where it's just sort of expected that every sentence you say um, is can be understood by itself. It can be understood standing alone. And it, um, it it's, it, I don't want to say true, but it's like, it's like 100% forceful. Like every sentence you write carries with it the tone of description. And I think this is one of those things that actually makes um, Aristotle essentially unreadable to the modern person. Like the modern person who's had their mind ate, you know, shot, shot full of holes from public school system. And then um, like our current, uh, um, you know, post-education, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, undergraduate programs in America, they're called like bachelor programs. These aren't any better. In fact, they're worse usually because... Um, the idea of enculturalization has now morphed um, very much into sort of these this idea of um, catching people up and, and sort of inducting them into these strains of thoughts, strain of thought that the professor wants to push. And I mean, this is like a big joke um, for philosophy students. If you ever talk to people who get their philosophy, you know, bachelors or anything, they'll make that joke where it's like, um, you know, what was my philosophy program? Well, it was like, um, you know, two books about the history of philosophy and then uh, 10 books by your professor's favorite French philosopher. Like, <laughs> like it's just kind of funny because it's just it's like this, that's the joke is that, you know, that you're not really there to learn philosophy. You're just sort of there to read your professor's favorite books. And, and so you sort of have this where it's just like these people go to these institutions of higher learning, quote unquote, and they get they get pulled, they get even further habituated into this extremely um very uh sort of specific very sort of um unthinking very headline oriented type of writing where it's just a series of propositions written with 100 percent force and are trying to be uh understood without regards to context and so it's like um and so you, they try to read Aristotle and they can't understand him. They can't understand him even in a basic way because one of the things Aristotle does is he, he writes a lot of his works with a very strong dialectic where he tries out an idea. He starts with an idea. He starts with a basic human experience and goes, let's assume this is true and let's start reasoning and let's see how far we can go. And um, he keeps going 
until he runs into a critical problem where he keeps gathering more of these basic human experiences. And then if you ever find something that becomes incoherent or something that comes contradictory, he goes, well, we need to find out why these are contradicting and which one is the one that remains because they can't, both can't be true, right? And this becomes part of the dialectic. And this can be confusing because he can go on for quite some time um, arguing or working through an idea that he ultimately uh, demonstrates to be false. And so this can be very difficult because a lot of people want Aristotle to write like a modern writer who writes these very clear prop propositions that can be understood without any context. They can be understood completely on their own, right? They're totally portable. Um, and they're written with 100% force, as in the person who wrote it is saying that the content is true. When Aristotle is not doing that, right? He's writing the content going, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. We need to work through this. We need to work through this like through through deliberation, through internal deliberation, right? We contemplate it. And so you have the situation where it's not that people can read them slowly. It's that they can't read them at all. And I've seen that. I've seen people tell me that. That they're like, I read it. It's just gibberish. They're like, it's literally gibberish. Like they'll read it and they'll like, I reread the section and it's like my eyes, I don't even know English anymore. It's so simple, but it, like, I can't follow the content. And it's like, because they've been habituated so badly into this kind of thinking that they can't, they cannot break out of that type of thought. It, it, it's almost like the reverse of enlightenment. It's like your mind has been so degraded that, it, that unless information is fed into it in a very specific way, it just, it, it, it just might as well not exist. I shouldn't even say that. It might as well just be unintelligible. So, and I think this is a big product of this sort of Western schooling system where it tries to teach you things in this specific way, in this very headline-like way. Um, because, and be, the, it's what happens, there's nothing authentic underneath it. You just become really familiar with a word. You become really familiar with words. You become really familiar with the context of those words and how to string them together and how to even argue, right? People will have huge arguments where they argue, oh, this is, this is the right way because of, because of X, Y, and Z, you know? And, um, and, but it, it, they actually don't even really know what those mean. They're not associated with anything. They're just vaguely associated with imagery, right? And so, um, you know, so, so keep that. So, and I think this is ultimately what is going on. So, you know, you want to be taught like this in a very specific way. So, um, I, I sort of think that's where we're at now, right? So if you're a teacher, there's this th third priority of maybe sort of teaching kids things, but what are you teaching them? Well, you're not teaching them authentic knowledge. You're not even teaching them useful knowledge. You're, you know, trying to teach them, you know, what I'm just calling headlines now. You're trying to teach them these snippets of words that they can repeat back to you, right? And I think this is also why math ends up becoming really special. And by special, I mean that in a bad way. It becomes very notorious because I think what happens is people want to teach mathematics in this same way where everything in mathematics is contextless and totally portable. And so math classes really just boil down to sort of teaching people these really specific techniques or, or processes, right? And then insofar as you can repeat these processes, you are quote unquote good at math. And I think this is why you see such an outrageous dropout rate in this higher sciences. Cause um, I remember at my school, I think my freshman physics class had like 20 something people in it. And by the time I graduated, I think like there was like four of us or something graduating. <laughs> it just, because what happens is I, I think, I love bringing this one up because this nobody ever has this one. People will take trigonometry. I guess people don't call it that anymore. They don't call it trigonometry. It's just called like pre-calc or something, which to me is, that's this is the beginning of the end as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, one of the things I, I tell people is I, I ask people, I said, Okay, so like sine, cosine, and, and tangent, like, um, we, we, you know, we call those trigonomic functions, right? What are they? Like, what are they doing? People won't have any answers. Just, they'll have no answers. 
Although they'll just be like, I don't know, you just press the calculator and, uh, you know, Sokotoa, right? That's the technique that you learn. That's how you use them. And, and, you, and I, I'll try to explain to them, you know, well, they're actually part of the unit circle. It's about measuring triangle. You know, it's about measuring circles and triangles inside of circles. So it's like it, these are just ideas they've never heard in their life. And this is why I think people start falling out because it's like you you get into these these physics programs, right? And at a certain point, you get asked, oh, well, you know, just uh, look at the system, set it up, and solve it. And it's just you might as well ask them to just fly to Mars or something. Hey, I just grow wings and fly, get out of here, right? It's like it's just impossible because there's this there's just no concept of reality of what you're actually doing. And this is how come you notice that people who graduate through like engineering and physics programs, they tend to be pretty good because at some point they'd realized, oh, that's what the trigonomic functions are about. It's about circles. And now they have authentic information. They have authentic knowledge. And now they can go on with their work. Right. And this becomes extremely critical in uh, so many things. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not even going to go into it right now, but basically, if you don't understand this little piece of information, you're just, you're done at physics, you know, physics three, you're just done. You're not going any further. It's just not going to be possible. But anyway, <clears throat> um, so, so that all said, that's where we're at now in a nutshell. We're at this point where if you want to be a teacher, you're your first priority is going to be to influence people into knowing what is acceptable and not acceptable in society. And your second priority is going to be to manage them during the day so that they can go home happy and healthy. And then the third part is going to be you need to be good enough to teach them how to remember headlines so they can remember these headlines later, even in math, right? This is why they teach math so poorly everywhere. The, 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 these like really basic prescriptions these really basic recipes right that you need to be able to convey this to as many people as possible so that they can uh spit it back up later and then that means you're a good teacher you've taught them headlines really well and that is where we're at so you know you might go so when does the real learning take place and this is actually tough because the system is designed to do these things I just mentioned, but every now and then you get a person who's really inspired and they go, I don't care about all this BS. I have a passion for writing or I have a passion for history or I have a passion for politics or I have a, I have a passion for whatever and I'm going to take these kids and I'm going to do my own thing and I'm going to teach them authentic knowledge and then they're going to be able to do all the stupid headline tests. Because that's, that's what all these tests are, like standardized testing. It's just, hey, do you remember these, are these, did the right headlines get taught to you? Well, it turns out if you have authentic knowledge, you can blow those, blow those questions away. No problem. So it's like, you, and every now and then you get these teachers who are super inspired and they're like, I have a passion for this and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do it right. I'm going to teach these kids important stuff. And then you notice they always do this interesting thing. You know, you have a good teacher if you notice they do this really funny thing. They basically let the kids who are sort of like duds i don't want to say that because i i hate when people just kind of write off kids like all together because they're bad at school it's like maybe they're bad at school because they're bad at, at basically being put in a sardine can and they're bad at being in prison you know i hate that but um intellectually speaking yeah there's a lot of kids who are just they're they're not that is not their skill that is not their place in the world and that's okay that's the other thing. I don't want to go on a digression, but I think one of the biggest failings in our culture is we associate being intelligent with being a good person. Or I shouldn't even say that, being intelligent with being a worthwhile person. I hate that so bad. It drives me up a wall. If, if you're like, it, it's just, it's just, it's so backwards. It's so, it's so bad. But anyway, you know, what starts happening is that it's like, it, it, you, these really good teachers who have this passion for a subject, they do the opposite of what they're told to do, which is, Oh, you got to worry about the kids who are doing badly. You know, you got to waste time on them. These people with passion, because their passion drives them, they just do the sensible thing. Hey, this kid, 
he clearly doesn't care about the subject. He clearly doesn't care about school. I'm not. I'm going to try to do my best not to ruin his life. So I'm just going to give him like a C minus or a D minus or whatever. And what's going to happen is I'm going to teach the good stuff. And then it's going to draw in the kids who are interested. And then I can focus my energy on them. And then now you have, and I'm going to talk about this in part two, um, a key recipe for actually teaching someone something authentic is that they want to be there and you want to be there. And like I said, we'll go over that more in a, in a bit. And, and then those teachers end up becoming the amazing teachers who the system sort of doesn't beat down. That kids remember. I had this English teacher, you know, kids will say that I have this teacher who really taught me this and they gave me all this extra attention. And me and like a couple of friends would always go talk to them and we'd learn all this amazing stuff. Those are the good teachers because they basically said, hey, I'm not gonna, I don't care what the system's doing. I'm just gonna sort of pass these kids who don't care and I'm going to teach something real and good, and the kids who want it are going to are going to pick it up, and the kids who don't care aren't. And that's totally backwards, right? Because the whole the whole thing is that our system tells these teachers to waste good good time and energy and good money, uh, you know, after bad on the kids who struggle. Like we got to save them all, and, and really that just comes out of the unculturalization thing, right? We got to get them all. They all got to be brainwashed, right? <laughs> Again, I use those terms and just instantly, like, it'll just turn people off. Oh, it's conspiracy. I'm like, no, this is, like I said, if I use their enculturalization, you know, normalization, these are their terms. Like, this is what they believe. You know, the, by they, I mean uh, the proponents of, like, the public school system, teachers, research, quote, unquote, researchers, right, government, you know, pro-government, you know, thinkers and stuff like that. So, you know, so it can be done. I do think it can be. You can have these good teachers, but the hurdles are that they have to essentially work against a system um, that wants them to do not that, that doesn't want them to do that, that doesn't want them to teach kids authentic knowledge because that's alienating. Not every kid will want authentic knowledge, so that means they can't have it. If you don't want to learn, you can't learn. This is going to be important in part two. I'll explain that. Um and you're not going to get everybody. You're only going to be able to really authentically educate maybe a few, you know, one out of 10 kids, if that even. But if you have a passion that you won't settle for anything less. So yeah, you'll be like a bad teacher, quote unquote, but um, you'll be a good teacher. <laughs> so, okay, I'll, I'll call that now for part one. And part two is where... I think is what I was originally being asked, which is how do I be a good teacher? As in, how do I teach people good things? And now let's go over that and we will, I will reveal to you everything I've experienced that I think is how people learn better. And maybe it can be transferred over to the uh, sort of mass teaching, uh, I don't know, mass teaching environment or whatever. So there we go.